Today on the Big Picture Skiing Podcast, you're going to hear from snowboarder Ryan Napton. Yes, that's right, skiers. A snowboarder is on the show, and I want you to listen up. This guy has some seriously great takeaways and really understands how to master something. This is coming from the fact in the interview I found out at one stage Ryan was in the top 20 of people in the world for solving a Rubik's Cube. So overall, I'm a huge fan of the way Ryan thinks and approaches things. You'll hear a couple of stories that really stand out, like when people said, you can't do this, and he went, you've got no idea, pal. Like, I know exactly what I'm trying to do. You're held back with your beliefs and current uh, sort of philosophies on things. And that part really resonates with me. And, And that's exactly my philosophy when I put videos on my big picture skiing website. It's about looking at things from other angles, not exactly reinventing the wheel, but can things be done better? Are they viewed, explained, and um, and shown in a way that makes sense? And are all possibilities explored? I mean, there's, yeah, you, you've got to listen to this interview. It is fascinating. It is honestly one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've done to date. And really, if you don't come away from this wanting to push the level of your skiing, have a better understanding of some ways to implement that and make progress, then I think you're missing something. You've got to come back and listen again. Now, just some context. I think it's really important when you hear from people that are really into a particular aspect, skill, or part of a sport, you're going to be hearing things that are very relevant to just that part. So Ryan has become obsessive, and I mean in a good way, to master the carving on a snowboard. So just like a ski racer will become obsessive and masterful in one aspect of skiing, but perhaps some of those areas are not what you want to do, say for moguls or big mountain skiing, they pertain to just parts of that sport. So just remember, whenever you're hearing stuff from Ryan, it could be, you know, if it doesn't make sense, think about it in terms of, well, why is Ryan thinking this way? It's because he's trying to master carving. That's the thing he is loving and enjoying and interested in in most and i think that's just a good reminder for us all at at all points when you when you're hearing from somebody just remember the the perspective the standpoint that that person is coming from and so their their information what they're trying to get across is really about that ultimate goal and uh yeah so that aside i really hope you enjoy this interview with ryan napton it's literally one of my favorite conversations i think you're going to learn a lot so without further ado Let's get started. All right, Ryan. Now, you are a a snowboarder, but I've been following you on YouTube and Instagram for a while, and this is a skiers podcast. Um, I'm going to quickly say why I've wanted to chat to you. So in a nutshell, like we were just chatting offline before, I think in any sport, if you can find universal principles, so, so we're both into turning particularly. Yep. You used to be into a lot more jumping. You still jump around a lot, but you love the feeling of, of carving. So turning. So turning sports like on a bike, a surfboard, skis, anything you're turning, there are universal concepts and principles that will help someone uh, you know, improve. And I see that you look at those things. So I'm like, this guy gets it. And um, so I've been wanting to chat with you, ask you some questions. And the goal here is for skiers to really learn from from someone outside of their sport because i think stepping away from your own sport and and having like a you know a broader view bigger picture view of things really can make a massive difference so that's why um i'm gonna throw it to you first can you give us some some background because i don't even know that much about your background what like when did you start snowboarding and then when did it start transitioning into you wanting to carve sounds good um it was, uh, I, I wanted to be from the age of 10. I wanted to be a snowboarder. I saw the pictures in the skateboard magazines. I wanted to be a snowboarder. So I started, I was terrible for about three years. Summer of 1994. I, I got the framework of snowboarding. Tom Nordwall, the head walk coach at high cascade snowboarding. Camp, or a Windell snowboard camp at that point, August 24th to 28th. What an amazing p- pivotal handful of days. He would not let us go to their park and pipe until after lunch. We had to work on our carving. And I remember him just 
we had to watch. He had to is pulled over at Mount Hood on the public lane up against the where the racers are. And he had us watching the snowboarders and he was relating their turns to the tricks. And, and he was, okay, here's your takeoff, landing, takeoff, landing. And it's just the skiers and, and snowboarders, both of them doing those motions. And then he has Dave Dowd, legendary snowboarder, come by and he's like, hey, Dave, will you uh, do some of your grab carving? And Dave Dowd grabs his board mid carve and just rips this turn. Mm -hmm. And then on the next turn, he mm -hmm. grabs the other edge and mm -hmm. rips the turn. Mm -hmm. And I'm 13 years old at that point, I think. And I'm like, oh my God, we're all nerds. <laughs> These guys know what they're doing and we, none of us can achieve that. But just that framework before going to the park just made sense. And then you, the rotations, like he even did it with 360s. Here's your takeoff. Here's your landing. So I understood those in my mind and just to find those turns that took work. And luckily I was able to do it at a young age, 14, uh, 13, 14, 15. Yeah. So that sounds like that was a pretty important bit of exposure. There you were shown, you were shown the link between, yeah, being able to master carving and, and then aerial maneuvers. Gonna, and I want to say this, like, I remember being that young and being, uh, like I wanted one of those top pros as my coach. If that w it wouldn't have worked if without him explaining snowboarding in that framework, we would not be chatting right now. That's how pivotal that idea is. Clockwise yeah. circle, counterclockwise circle, clockwise circle, counter attacking down the hill, essentially all at all times. Crazy. So then how far did you take your snowboarding? Like after that, you, you got pretty good, competed, yeah. um, sponsored. So I'll, 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 I need to describe it like this because none of this would have happened without a mindset change. I was already a pretty committed dude. When I was 10 years old, I ran the Twin Cities Marathon, 26.2 miles and whatever yardage. And I just remember the pain and like, oh my God, how do I keep my legs moving? but I wanted to finish it. So I finished it. And then I realized I didn't love running compared to gliding. So even after the marathon, I went home and was skateboarding. <laughs> and then the next day, my body really paid for it. But uh, um, <laughs> it was a commitment of like, check this out. Here, here's, here's where the real change happened. The pivotal change in my own snowboarding. I was competing. I was not having success. I could feel my own progression happening, but I just was not winning contests. I did not even, I never qualified for nationals previously. And I did not qualify for the 1994 five nationals when it was in Giants Ridge, Minnesota. So I knew my parents would have let me go to that one. Like it was right in Minnesota. I, I couldn't qualify. My top results were like a fourth and some other jazz. And at 15 years old, I was literally the spring of that year. After knowing that I didn't qualify, I was just disappointed. I'm like, well, I still love this snowboarding stuff. I love it. So instead of trying to compete, I'll just be the best snowboarder I can be. So I embraced that. And that spring, I made so much transformational changes. And I'm seeing these guys in my head in Minnesota at Giants Ridge competing in nationals. So a bunch of my heroes, Chad Otterstrom, he won numerous things there. John Summers won the pipe, I think. And I'm just at, at uh, Highland Hills in Minnesota. I have some ski, had some ski racing friends, and that's where they were training. So I got rides to these resorts like Buck Hill and Highland Hills, Afton Hills, Wild Mountain, all the time through their parents. And so it was convenient. At least I had access to be able to go out there and keep on working on my craft. But at this point, it's just be the best snowboarder I can be. So I gave up on competing. But sure enough, I just made all these gains really quick in one spring. And then the next year, my first day at Buck Hill, John Cow, rest in peace. He tells me I'm going to win nationals. He saw me doing these big switch backside five forties off this roller and no one could keep a clean enough, not line to do it, how I was doing it and making a certain landing just from the articulations of the hill. 
and he get that gave me so much confidence a guy who i look up to looked up look up looked up to and still look up to john kyle um when he told me that i was like yeah let's go and so i was riding i was able to ride buck hills half pipe almost every night and just i kept working on my craft working on my craft making it fun for me and then i won nationals first year at it and i won the whole darn thing the next year i got second behind the very talented abe teeter and uh yeah amazing yeah and then it, you know it, let's fast forward i uh i never really made it as a pro as even junior world championships going into the finals of the junior world championships 1997 i was four points ahead of everyone going into the finals back then it was a combined score thing and this girl gave me my first kiss right before my run <laughs> of finals and i literally forgot my run mid run <laughs> So that doesn't work out, of course. <laughs> and then I couldn't make it up. I tried my ass up to uh, to pull out everything extra I could do in the second run, but you know it's too late at that point. So, uh, but that was in, in like taking steps back to now that I'm 44 years old. I am glad that that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Had I won that, had I had more success in that, all those people that I adored their snowboarding and I had their pictures on my walls as a kid and all this. And, you know, they, I'm competing against some of these guys, uh, a lot of these guys, they don't, not many of them have inspiring snowboarding anymore within them. Uh, too many of them, the jumps got so big after that era and a lot of them ended up broken and they're not snowboarding to where it's inspiring. And, you know, it's, it's a bummer because they were so good. They were so talented. They had so much skills and creativity. But when we break our bodies, you know, it's it shuts the whole operation yeah. down of having fun. And that's where it needs to be, just going out and having fun. So I'm so glad that I'm just getting to enjoy snowboarding on these new yeah. new and different levels that like this is this is where my life's at now. Just go out and see how good I can feel, make snowboarding feel to me. And if something doesn't feel right, I just call up Sean Martin of Donick Snowboards. We chatted last night. I have a new snowboard from 10 days ago. And we chatted last night on day nine of riding. And I already wanted new changes. And he sees it and gets it. And so the core thickness is changing. And then this board will be for a couple of different purposes. And um he, wow. He's literally will tell me like, you're not breaking the bank by experimenting with what you want. So, yeah, and he gets okay. it because he's a carver himself. He's an Alpine snowboard carver and he's an engineer. So with, yeah, that's I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hold you there because yeah. that's a bit I want to get into, but I want to go back to like, I love it when people get takeaways from, from chats like this. And so I would say, I want to ask you, like the, the big part there that I think is important is you were aiming at just competing and, and winning. So there was that mindset. And then there was the change to you're just going to be as good as you can be and focus on everything that makes that possible. And if that's good enough, so be it. Exactly. And the, um, win, the winning, the, that was never a priority, never a yeah. priority, never a priority. I just wanted to do what I could do. Yeah. So then do you like, cause I would say most people probably listen to this are not going to be, they're not going to be in the boat even at all of thinking about competing. There'll be a small percentage that will, yep. but I think that's really important if people don't get their mindset right of like, how are they approaching the sport they're doing? Then yeah, you're going to speed it up or, or slow it down. And I've been doing a lot of like reading into uh, like flow state and and all that sort of stuff yeah and and just you know how you have to be so curious and pushing like your limits by four percent doesn't have to be much like but you have to yeah, tiny 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 limits but you have to be doing that and you have to be really like i guess intrigued yourself a, a, as you are and i think there's just like a perfect case and example of of it of it getting you um somewhere and then the, and then the second thing is too like you said you kind of whether you it wasn't your fault or not but luckily fate stepped in and you didn't end up with broken ankles and then 
not really wanting to snowboard. I don't know. I don't know how that, I don't know how you frame that. Maybe that's just like, I think there's always a positive to everything that happens. You might, you know, at the time, that's yin and it, yang, a, yin and yeah. yang. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. You got to take the good with the bad, the bad with the good, and yeah. try to figure out got, how to enjoy it. And you got to kiss. And you got what? a kiss for a girl. You got a kiss for a girl. I mean, that's mad. <laughs> you know, how good is that? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, when Kristen listens to this, she's going to cringe. <laughs> My girlfriend. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But hopefully the other girl is going to be like, hey, uh, Ryan, no problems. Saved all those hospital visits. And <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyway, anyway no, moving no. on. So you started talking about Donic snowboards. And I think you and I have very much on the same page here. Equipment matters and yes. the type of snowboarding ryan does is very much focused on on carving now and he does some very creative cool spins and and linking be- between turns kind of tricks and, and playing with that sort of stuff but at the core of it it's it's how to lay that beautiful smooth high powered arc equipment is so critical when did you realize that because i think i watched an old video of yours and i don't think you were on some kind of a it was like the moonwalking one that my so when when did that happen how did like how did you meet the donic guy and yeah for the most that. extreme end of this my range of snowboarding my very first youtube video is on what was at the time and probably still is the lightest board on the market they don't make it anymore but it was so light and flexy and flimsy and but i, I you know i was given the board i knew the owner <laughs> and it worked really good for what I was trying to do in that time frame for the buttering, especially. It wasn't a twin, so the nose and tail were different. And of course, with riding half pipe, I broke the tail of it. So on that in that video, very first video, the tail is broken. So some of my options are in the wrong format of what I described with clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. But in the, the carving stuff in that, you'll just see these low edge angle carves and they're just boring. Now I'm trying to hit just high edge angles nonstop and just party with them. And since those turn shapes have become so quick, I've had to increase radius, 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 radius over the years. And it, that, that's a long process, increasing radius and feeling comfortable with the four major chords for me are a toe side carve, a heel side carve, a switch toe side carve, and a switch heel side carve. So I need those four lines. And when I go up in radius, it's always a new, I have to work on finding the real comfortable levels with that new radius. Yeah. But then, but when then, it comes... And then after that, when I go back to the tiny radiuses, it's so easy. And it's just like, ah, why is this turn ending so soon? Yeah. Yeah. I would say I'm a, I found a similar kind of journey. I was doing a lot of carving on a slalom ski. So 13 meter radius, which is short for a ski. But then now I'm really enjoying like 17, 18 meters and, and going up from there. You just, uh, yeah. So how did you like, what were there any, yeah, how okay. did you get there? I, how did you get to, to that point? Yeah, I get yeah. it back, back to the original part. Um, as soon as my body was knowing that I still love half pipe Tom. I still love half pipe, but it's my second year ever on a snowboard in 34 years that I've not ridden half pipe. Breckenridge doesn't have one anymore. I moved out here specifically for the half pipe and I'm really glad I did. I love it here. And some of my friends that I moved out here are still with, but after I was done with the half pipe and park, you know, or scaling that down and not trying more and more, then I was, uh, I still loved snowboarding. So I just kept peak seven. It opened during that era. And all of a sudden there's these empty runs during the spring and they have all this, all these roles that I was able to play with. So I'd go out there first thing in the morning, every morning and use that as my warm up, just playing around with these little butters and turns with all these nice rolls on empty runs. And then eventually the sun would come around enough light up both walls of the half pipe. And then that's where I'd want to be at. And that helped helped my half pipe riding. Cause then my physical body was really in tune with my edges. And it just made that even make more sense. But I'm always about reps and 
I just, all those extra reps in different ways really helped my half pipe riding. And literally I was winning a pro, the last pro contest I won or ever did okay. <laughs> right there. But yeah, where was that? Where was, when did you get a, a real dedicated carving board? Cause you're like, you're pushing maybe the board you had yep. and it's chattering or whatever. Yeah, exactly. The chatter that, and it wasn't, it wouldn't even be the, it would be booed out because I wasn't riding okay. too fast for the radius. It was booed out as you're dragging those heel cups, dragging the toes. And I got, I was like, man, I want, I, I'm, I'm literally already w- making YouTube videos and I'm watching. I'm obsessive, Tom. I'm obsessive. I'm <laughs> watching these guys, uh, guys on swords, snowboards, and uh, Don, uh, yeah, every, every preseason and postseason at the time. I don't have a a basin pass anymore, but I'd always see these guys on Donick snowboards and these others with these uh, on on top of hard boots with these trench diggers. So 28 millimeters of lift. Okay. This is what I've been. I've been bringing out two boards a day right now, just for that extra clearance, because as soon as the snow so soft that I'm starting to boot out, then it's just like, well, do I just like be done with the day or do I play with the mountain in different ways? What if I can achieve those same edge angles without booting out? So that was the thought process back then. I'm on Burton Custom at that point, Burton Custom Wide and Burton Custom X Wide. And I'm just still booting out left and right. And yeah, it, uh, <laughs> like don't let anyone ever tell you what's possible. I want to share this story, Tom again, I probably would have, I'm not taking a path that has been forged. So I've been willing to trust myself because I've seen this aspect in Rubik's cubing. Like I said, I'm pretty obsessive. When I got into Rubik's cubing, I got really into it. And I became one of the top 20 Rubik's cube fastest solvers on the three by three. Wow. And and so I've competed in the world championships, us nationals. Those are the two that I went to. And I could bring my time, my average time down below what was officially the world record. So that was about 18 seconds. And then I'm on, uh, I'm, I'm at the world championships and I'm, I'm a, I'm a fly on the wall, Tom. I always want to hear what other people have to say. And I'm overhearing the event organizer and the top couple Rubik's cubers in the world at that time talk about what the fastest times that human being can possibly solve a Rubik's cube on average. And you want to know what their answers at this time. And I saw through it. I saw through it already, but they're saying about 17 seconds, maybe 16 seconds. And here we are over 20 years later, Tom, and with the resurgence of information sharing through the internet, five-year-old kids are crushing those times literally some wow cubes are getting solved in five seconds tom i know the the methods i used to do it and they are just so far beyond it and even the cubes have gotten better for speed solving it's crazy and then you see it on america's got talent someone juggling and solving i can't comprehend (laughs) what they're doing it is amazing so I, i i already had a deep instinct of don't let anyone tell you what you're capable of. So I knew I was booting out. I had already gone to sh- with the first wide board I wanted to try. I literally went to a local snowboard shop and I wanted to rent one just to try it. And I kid you not, the manager told me, what size boot are you on? And I say 8.5 or I was on nine at that time. I've squeezed in since um, I was on nine boots. And they tell me, there's no way you need a wide board. And I just knew, you don't see what I'm capable of on a snowboard. Like, let's go. So I, I called, t- texted or called my friend Pete at Unity Snowboards. I, I did end up try, trying a couple friends' wide board. I didn't ride one. And then, and then once I was like, yes, this is the direction I need to go after uh, trying my friend Damien's why 159 custom x i was like yes this is the direction i need to go i did not like the buttering aspects the board was just the nose and tail were too far away from me it felt 
but that width, I could absolutely notice it with what edge angles I could achieve. So that board, it was probably, it was still under 26 centimeters wide, Tom. So it, this isn't my current board, the current one's right there, but uh, this is 32.6 centimeters wide, and the other one's 32.9 centimeters wide. That's such a big difference in 26. Yeah, yeah, massive. And so the, then did you... You, you did, were you going to go somewhere uh so then ha, like how did you find the, so, the donic so, yeah. guy okay t- yeah okay oh, <laughs> i can get lost in my own thoughts brother um so so i started having pete from unity snowboards make me boards after i was like yes this is the direction i could go but there was not anything out there with a pure side cut they all had big old gimmicks of big wide parts around where the feet are and I've already known the experiences of that. That's a topic you might want to ask me, but it, it's small. Uh, I do. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, okay. What would I call that? Just because I want to come back to that. Well, you know, like the black, the black hole effect. <laughs> the black okay. hole. A black, black hole, hole is Perfect. what ends up, you end up on your face. <laughs> okay. I'll ask you that later. So anyway, you, so you want, you wanted a true side cut. Yeah. I wanted a pure side cut and I just wanted wider and I did not want the excess length. So Pete is, you know, he, he is not, he, he has a tradition, he had a, you know, the, they, they aren't in business anymore, but they had a, you know, standard production snowboard stuff where you press out a bunch of boards over the summer and market them that previous, you know, get the riders on and market them and sell them, you know, the next winter. Um, so, but, he, so he had to custom cut out and custom make me board. So he was charging me and what a great deal. Um, Cause I got to learn a lot. So the first very first board specs I jumped up to were 27.5 centimeters wide. And instantly I had this freer glide. You know, I'm just not getting that friction. I didn't know enough about my own snowboarding and how much I could push that. So it was a couple of weeks of riding it in a lame way versus all of a sudden, once I realized like trying to boot up, trying to dig my heels into the ground, trying to dig my toes into the ground. All of a sudden I was like, whoa, I can still boot out this so easily. So then I had to make me a second one with a 29.7, uh, thir- uh, 29 centimeter waist width. And the very first run on that board, whenever I get a new board, I hold back time. But the, <laughs> ver- the very first run on it, I was like, yes, this is what I'm searching for. <laughs> oh yeah, let's party. And then, uh, he wasn't really open to, you know, I, I had an idea concept in mind for a beast mode series of snowboards and he, he didn't see it. And even he, when he built me the first 27.5, he, you know, <laughs> gave it to me and just like, Holy cow, this is the widest thing I've ever built. And, uh, and was and kind of probably doubtful. He was super doubtful, Tom. He, uh, when he, what year he, is this? He, he even tried to describe to me about the shape of a turn and why I shouldn't be booting out. And I just saw through it again. It was like, uh, yeah. And then, yeah. uh, so I'm writing those boards. And then eventually, through the emails, Sean Martin just sends me an email. Thank you, Sean, for this email. He says, Hey, I would, I, yours, you, yours are the only videos that make sense out there. I would love to sponsor one of your videos. And I was already very aware of Donic snowboards. And I was just like, they're, they're primarily Alpine snowboard stuff, race stuff in my, um, in my mind. And I was just like, all right, Sean, you are custom building boards one at a time. I'm riding custom boards. This is exactly what I need. Like if, 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 can I try one of your boards and if it works for me, I'd like to take this a lot further than just you sponsoring one of my videos. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Dream so come, what... Some dreams do come true. Like that's all I can think of when my connection with finding Sean Martin in this world and or, uh, us find no knowing each other. So to help me, help me here. At the time, from your knowledge, did, was that pretty much the widest? Like no one else was trying to do this. Is that no. 
Yeah. Right. They're all, yep. yeah. They're all just following yep. what the designers are doing. No one's gone and said to the designers, Hey, I can't do what I'm trying to do with this. I need it. And what year was that? Um, I, I don't even know the year. Or roughly. 2000, a bit after graduating college. So at that point, especially, it's a real heavy focus on just how good can I make snowboarding feel for myself? So yeah. m- maybe, uh, I don't even know, t- mid to, t- 2000, 2011, 2012. It, it, yeah. it, I could go through my YouTube not, videos and find it. But no, it's, not, yeah, but not, not that. Even, yeah, it's not like yeah. I was just trying to. Is it like early two thousands? But like two thousand ten, yeah. twelve, something. Yeah, somewhere. something like something like that. And then uh, along Amazing. the line, along the lines of other companies now going wider. So at that time, there was not the widths, and if there was the width, there was the black hole effect. I've ridden boards with where they really go extra extra wide. I've ridden the extreme ends of the versions of it where they go a standard side cut radius, but under the feet a big old bump essentially tilt one of those on edge enough yeah. and all of a sudden it just gives out you just that middle of the board just loses just contact push. with the snow and you're on your butt or you're on yeah. your face i took one single run on the most extreme version of that and it was on the mellowest run ever tom like the bunny hill essentially a long bunny hill at breckenridge that i still love because it's steep enough once you got your speed you can still jam it out it's big and wide um but it was the most miserable experience snowboarding that I had had in an extremely long time. And so I realized what didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So then now on to like a bit away from equipment, I might come back to some questions there, but if, uh, if you're now being able to push the limits, you're not booting out, you're really getting some angles. What becomes apparent to you as like the biggest I don't know, like the weakest link in your boarding. Is it the transition? Is it when you reach the high edge angles? Is it just after that? Where do you go to next? And like, do you reckon there's a pivotal moment in your carving technique where you worked at it and then carving just got way better after that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> once I got big on, on these bigger, wider board. <laughs> Tricky question there's there's two just too many aspects that i don't know which order is the most important <laughs> um okay how about how about the transition then i'm going to hit you because uh, you yes. and i made a, a little yes. video to, uh, directed at skiers using your snowboarding as an yep. example on the transition was, my, on the my, transition my switch stance heel from the toes to the heels is still by far and away my hardest one i'm out there this morning what do i do every day every day i make sure i work on that transition and the thoughts for that, I, I know I just have to trust myself. And to trust myself, it's very subconscious thoughts because I don't have the millions and millions and millions and millions of reps doing it on a on a on, on that these large radius. On, okay, on, on the like large, on, on okay. small radius, it's easy for me. On the large radius, I need to hit certain spots of my board bending, and that's as early as possible. And the, the simplest thought for me is I just have to see that board tilting. I already have to see it tilted over there before I, I ever get there. And then yes. I, I can go really subconscious internally and just use that and just then take a an approach. Of an, one of my favorite quotes from Mo Norman, take a an alert attitude of indifference and just judge how it felt, what the results were. But the big thing is, is, as long as I can visualize where that high edge angle is going to, how it's going to get there instantly. And it's got kind of, it has to go high edge angle to high edge angle. It can't be like low edge angle, boom, or low edge angle one way. And then bing, it's got to. Like it has to be progressive. Hang on, hang on, boom. No, I don't want progressive. No, no, you, it's bam. Yes, bam. That's my okay. little love tap on the top of the mountain. I want to give some energy back to the mountain, a little top. Everyone's yep. so heavy at the bottom, bottom, and they just I think they probably should have a little. Might even have a little circle here for that. Yeah, this one may work. Like, does that can, is that visible? Yep. yep. So, so yep. That, we can see it. So the second one, I had traced my beer can, literally traced uh-huh. my beer can, and it's circular. Yep. 
the first one it's low edge angle and then what happens everyone ha ends up with all these forces around six uh seven o'clock and five mm -hmm. o'clock mm -hmm. they end up with all those forces there and that just doesn't feel good to me when pure carving you know um yes so i, I just want i just want to hit the symmetrical circle so if we're talking a perfect c one you know that's and then to achieve that this is the sloppiest load diagram ever but it's like i'm going up if i want to achieve the circle yes. it's like i'm going up but the board is actually just doing its own circle and that's what that's the i don't have to think about what how i'm doing that i just need to know hey the board's going to do this and then i yeah. can relax and as soon as i hit that it feels like set it and forget it it's just like boom i'm on this new high edge angle and since I'm on a large radius, I have a long time to just like to disconnect. enjoy that. Exactly. Enjoy it. Disconnect my head, look around. Uh, you know, if I'm actually going down, I'm just reading the train and the traffic. It's very focused. I'm not looking off in the distance or anything, but I, I just want to hit those high edge angles, mm -hmm. set it, forget it and enjoy the enjoy what I'm seeing and enjoy thinking of where I want to hit those next lines. And so then the train on a really high level there if there's a snowmobile track oh i'm changing certain trajectories of edge angles because i don't want my turns to be on that if uh if i'm with my if i'm snowboarding out there by myself i'm not worried about any of my trenches i can carve right through them if i'm snowboarding with, out there with people who are trench diggers like guys who are slamming turns and digging you know six inches down into the snow all of a sudden I have to worry about their tracks and th mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, something I'm working on. And that's why I have these, I haven't tried these, those uh, power plate, uh, the 28 millimeters of lift with these for years and years now. Cause at that point I was still on 27.5 wide. So it's the first time where I'm enjoying riding these super slushy conditions where it just sinks and still keeping the glide intact. So I'm yeah. using my normal <laughs> board, my newest board on the first half of the day, but as soon as I'm starting to feel that boot out stuff happen, like starting to like, ooh, this is going to be an issue. Then I just swap my bindings over to the extra lift. And then I can make all those lines happen efficiently and easily and trust the turns better. Uh, of course, with rising above the board, freestyle wise, it just it feels like I'm standing above something else. So that aspect sucks. But uh, otherwise, yeah. at least I can still go and and ride this uh really soft snow where everyone else is just struggling i'm seeing accidents non-stop because of its snow snake effect you know if you yeah, catch yeah. part of resistance of your ski boots bindings etc people are just crashing even today this morning there's a guy who i help i pick up his ski pole and deliver it 40 meters down the hill to him like and he's crashed i watched the whole thing he just got going too fast didn't know what to do and he eats it and then i go and get on the chairlift and sure enough the same guy i didn't see how we crashed this time but he's got both his poles up the mountain 40 <laughs> meters above him again and his skis ejected it's like wait why don't you just go and go slow and find <laughs> some control <laughs> control slow is good we like yeah. if we, can, if we can just find control is slow well, then we can start to ease into getting aggressive with our motions. So then the, the transition thing and that push a bit up the mountain. So trying to make that nice curve and, and avoid just building all the forces at the end. That's probably, probably one of the hardest, but most key things that you're going to be aiming for is uh, if you're after that perfect turn, yep. have you found a few like then talking about other people trying to do that have you found any good cues or things that help others discover that yeah even this has even helped myself massively tom i'm gonna bust out some graphics that i drew perfect i am i am an artist with the edge of my snowboard not with my calligraphy of my hands all right <laughs> <laughs> so here's the jam i want you to think about a uh a, a visible light spectrum range it, should i do a screen share real quick for this yeah let me just uh make you host 
All right, Tom, I'm back in action. Figured out how to do a screenshot. So here's the NASA science share, the science visible light spectrum. And if we are looking at that red line, the radius is so big with it, right? Visible light spectrum. And then mm -hmm. it goes to tighter radius and tighter and tighter and tighter as you work through Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and go violet, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So this is my theme, just like, it's small, big, large, large, large radius to tight radius. We're only on a thick, we're on a single, we're, we're not on a radius that really changes too much. There might be variable side cut radiuses to our equipment. So the real change that we can hit, even if we're on, if we're on, if, if this, whatever our range is here, we can change mm -hmm. the vibrational energies of it through edge angles. So for me, it corresponds directly from very low edge angle, that red visible light spectrum, and you're in balance mm -hmm. with a heel side carve and then toe side with those edge angles. And it works its way up all to that, all the way to that purple and white light. And that's where it really, you know, hitting high edge angles. And then the board is at those high edge angles. It's storing, you know, higher vibrational energy level yeah and then it brings it back we're low edge angle you ain't getting that performance out of it it's just not gonna happen but you hit those like you know those green lines the blue lines the purple lines where it feels like you're almost pushing 90 degrees out on the mountain yes and that's where it's like yes and does that happen every day no conditions don't warrant it every day but when the conditions are firing and the body's firing that's where that's where like real skin you, and snowboarding set. Have you used this like kind of visual with some other people? Like, hey, and so almost like, hey, you. Uh, so then you could almost speak in, hey, let's push into the green. The only time I've ever, the only yeah. time I've ever shared it like that was uh, during a uh, having a great me Mexican restaurant dinner with uh, Sean Martin, of course, uh, from Donick Snowboards at, after one of the days at Nationals. And a Cassie level four examiner, and she's incredible. She's a triathlete. She's got her spirit oh, animal. Yeah, gosh. Yeah, yes. I know Melon. Yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah. my goodness, she she impressed the hell out of me how she can ride a snowboard. That was incredible. Absolutely. Like so much power and adjustability and yeah, just knowledge. <laughs> like awesome. So uh, so here's my drawn diagram. Yes. So uh, here's my Donick snowboard. Yeah, it's I purposely awesome. I purposely kept the graphics all black on top. Uh -huh. they, they they can do any artwork you want, and the people's art. My my girlfriend she has Chad Otterstrom's picture of Breckenridge with all these pink lights, and then these, uh, he, and then one of our foosball friends did the artwork with this tree, adding trees and birds, and it's just beautiful artwork. So I've seen so many things with graphics alone that are amazing. I have purposely kept all of my boards pure black just to yeah. show just to show that graphics do not matter. They don't matter one bit in relation to your performance trying to mm -hmm. come down a mountain, you know, a chairlift dropped you off. How do you want to approach this task? So yeah. uh, here, here's the way that I think about it <laughs> for the circles. The uh those red lines are those red. low edge angles and red. It might not even be a board that is visibly tilted off of the ground, but it is pressure on that edge. And it's just the biggest circle. And I always warm up with some of those, just those reds, those orange, those yellows. I always warm up on those. And if I like today, I knew there was going to, there's these rolls on peak seven that I love buttering on, but Am I willing to put tons of real work into if conditions are firing, I can go right off the bat, but it's springtime conditions. I wanted to feel the takeoffs and landings because right now I can squish sometimes if they just groomed it right before I can squish like that much into the yeah. snow. And that sucks versus like one centimeter of depth. Yeah. So yep. I, I, I'm willing to give myself the patience to test out the snow with real turns before I go into the full freestyle carving mode that I can do. And then throughout the day, it just gets more and more accurate 
until the snow conditions or traffic on the crowds fails me. Hey, how, how important is using a hand or an elbow to do what you're doing? And do you have the goal of like one day you are like, literally it's your nose maybe, but it's just the, like, talk to me about that. Cause I'll tell you what, in skiing, sometimes there's people who like, you know, they kind of go, Oh, you can't drag your hand or you can't touch, you know? And, and I'm just like, man, for one, it feels so good. Like, and then two, there's a functional reason behind it. Anyway, I'm interested to know, are you trying to like push not using it? How high edge angle can you get? Or do you not care? It's, it's essential. So use it. Speak to that. For me, it is using it none at all. Tom, I am taking mellow physics for what I'm doing. Let me uh, go into with the yin yang aspect. I have okay. friends that will carve mm-hmm. on steeper terrain than me. And they, I, I know the sensations of that, of like, ooh, it's one more body part that is giving a sensory input to where I'm at. And they're not pushing their hands into the snow, but it's just there and touching yes. it. And it's just part of, you know, it's a mind, body, soul experience. Yeah, like a finger, a finger on the wall yeah. if you're bouncing on one foot. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they, it actually helps them. I'm not willing to put in, I'm pretty lazy as a snowboarder. I'm not willing to put in those, especially with a big meter radius board. I'm not willing to put in the work for those tight, tight turns down steep terrain. And there are better uh, physics of boards for that type of stuff, other than being on a twin, especially if it's soft snow. And yeah, these are things I'm working on. But uh, for me, I'm, I'm, if if I have one metric in snowboarding, I'm the best glider. I'm just gliding on those circles. I'm gliding, gliding, and I just read the train and have a very in-depth sense of what's too fast and what's too slow. Most of the time, I'd rather be on the edge of too slow because I can just add extra energy into dropping my weight and pushing earlier. But too fast, you're just dealing with a lot of forces. I'm never in a race to get to the bottom. If I was, my turns wouldn't be what they are. Um, I don't know. Did I ask you answer your question, or did I forget where we're? Yeah. Where we're, so where then, we're going? so I guess I'm like, do you are you trying to aim for, uh, like, could could you achieve those angles where you're literally lying on the ground on a yeah, snowboard yeah. Yeah. without anything but the edge? No, nope. that's my question. No, no my, okay. I, I can't be static, but that's, or, uh, I cannot be in that position and not feel something out there. Okay. So what, let me show you my jacket, Tom. Yeah, this is, this is cool. And, and again, cause remember like a lot of skiers listening here Yeah, yeah. and I recently put out a video on, on using hand drags as a drill to get people comfortable, like getting to that. Understood. Blue, understood. Yeah. yeah. The, the weight should not be on the hand. The weight should not be on the arm. I use no. my arm because that's the last place I can get some of my bo- the rest of my body out of the way of the carve. So, and then if I'm using friction of a normal ja- jacket material, it's it too it, it, it catches. It's abrasive. It catches. Yeah. Tom, so I've just for the people fault. that are that are listening, and, just and, just because some people will listen, not uh, uh view it, but but Ryan's jacket arm all the way up to the elbow is that duct tape or what's material this, this is a marine fabric vinyl this is the slickest one i have and okay. i just very slippery fab- yeah very slippery there's no friction at all so if i just touch like i'm not doing i'm not strong enough to do a plank tom i'm not <laughs> <laughs> like I, it's the arm is just there and then to soften it, it, it just in case the elbow hits i don't i don't want like a pivot a divot I don't want my, you know, the divot should be the edge of the the board, the edge of the skis. That's the arced sliver in the slope that is important. If you're dragging dragging a trench through your elbow, oh God. So I wear, I wear elbow pads and these have actually saved my, me a couple of times in instances that I messed up and taken slams, but I've also taken falls where I've fallen on this and I just carve on through like, Ooh. 
I touched it for a split second and my, yeah. the, the, it didn't disrupt my turn. I've literally messaged one of my race, a couple of my racing friends like, Hey, I was like ripping these quick turns, boom, boom, boom. And I fell and I instinctively went right there, but I never lost to disruption, real risk disruption of what I could achieve next. So I was like, you gl- you're able to glide on the on the exactly. elbow essentially. There so was no yeah. there was no friction there. So I was, yeah. I was just like, you guys might want to do this for racing, just in case any you know of those yeah. weird things happen. Like you could just get right back up and into the groove. Like literally, totally. if it was on a race course. Mm-hmm. I didn't lose time. <laughs> like uh, so then uh, for like that maybe the snowboard is this thing. Is there is there you're aiming for elbow, not hand. Yeah, correct. For, yeah, for, for me, I have friends that are really proficient at using the hand. Some uh-huh. of them are very proficient at it, and they are using gloves with a similar material. And okay. I've literally provided one of them with a, a pair of mittens that a Russian company builds or something, and it's the extreme carvers use those. Okay. Okay. For for me, I didn't like the feel of the mittens, and I didn't like the feel. I, I just like the feel of like high quality gloves and I, I, yeah so, so I, I also can't have snow going up the sleeve so i yeah. always am grabbing the base of the sleeve and then just using this one lever in yeah complete parallel with yeah. with the wrist with the wrist up I, actually the yeah. whole lever is utilized and it has padding underneath it so it's yep. so gentle in the snow but it's yeah. a, it's more of like when i'm at that high of an edge angle is just get the rest of the body out of the way. Yeah, yeah. I must say it's it's kind of cool because when I was able to get higher edge angles and starting to put the hand and stuff on the snow, I've I really focus now more on not the hand, but but the forearm and elbow. And I just think, you know, it does a couple of things for me. One, if I'm thinking hand, I tend to maybe reach my body out of that alignment with the edge. So then I've just screwed it all up. I'm not now connected to the edge as much. The elbow, because it's close to my body, I feel like I'm more one whole thing. I mm. say as a unit. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And even like you think boxes, like, you know, mm-hmm. you keep flexing in here. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's it's stronger, right? But you, as soon as you go too open, it, yeah, you, you start like core stability, all that gets looser. Yeah. Yeah. So so I like the uh, the parallel there. And, and I definitely am trying to put more similar to you here down, not, not just knuckle and, and hand when yeah. I get to. If you ever want to, if you ever want to fully utilize it, I'll uh, build you a jacket and send it to you. Okay, cool. <laughs> like you, just, and you just I'm... wear some paintball elbow pads underneath. And, yeah, and you could use that far, forearm in new ways that you never imagined. <laughs> um, that's it. I'm doing it. I'm cool. doing it. Cool. That's, that's and cool. Ch- check this out, Tom. So even this this jacket, it's by West Beach. They offered me a pro pro model jacket years ago, years and years ago, and I still might take them up on this. But I don't want everyone going out and thinking that's the ultimate version of snowboarding. Because what I've seen is people who aren't carving, just laying on the ground, and then they're they're using some weird trajectories out there that are putting themselves in massive danger. So I yes. held back on that. Like it's a money making opportunity for me, but unless they're utilizing it in the right way, then could be chaos. It's bad, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so I'm gonna I'm doing a bit of a summary here on the last our last sort of 20 minutes or so of, of of chatting here. I think a really important thing for people going towards like really awesome, perfect carving skis or snowboard, doesn't matter. Your warm-up, and I love the the light spectrum thing, like start in the red zone. You, like and and like someone said to one of my students the other day, I was like, I looked at my tracks the other day and they were from the lift and they were dirty. So I went back and I cleaned them up. And I think like if people did that, well, I think there would be several things going on. I think the slopes would stay way better for longer, Yes, (laughs) you know, like because they're not grinding through stuff and and churning it up. So people start there and like get so good at the red then the orange, then the yellow. And, and then, you know, and then as you start pushing those boundaries, you're going to find, Oh, dirty, the line, dirty, the edge. This is where I got to stay at the moment, you know, cause that's that 4% I'm pushing into. I can't, you know, no point going beyond that because it's, 
just it's just all a mess. You don't actually progress in that zone. Yep. Um, but yeah, that would be my summary of takeaways to hell with people because totally agree. People don't slow things down enough. Go to easier terrain and just like feel what the heck is going going on. You know, they're missing all these sensations. Like you say, 100. you feel there's this top part of the turn that you got to be like aware of and feeling. And so, so many people just miss. Yep. In my mind, 40, what, 50%. When you, when you say this, what comes to my mind, I was young, 13, 14. I read in a Wall Street Journal or something how many pounds of snow the average skier pushes and snowboarder pushes down the mountain. And yeah, like that's all I think about now. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. everyone just pushes snow down the mountain. And it's like, wait, why, why did we go out there and beat it up? Let's give that thing some energy back. Such a simple thought. Let's just yeah. work with the mountain. Like, hey, I can finish this turn even up the hill a ways and snap some energy up towards the, the Mr. Mountain. It's just a big old smiley face up there. <laughs> yeah. And you get to live a life <laughs> and you just get to be on a mountain enjoying it. Let's give and it you some know, energy back. Totally. And like on that point of like, I don't know, preservation of the of the slopes and everything, like a, a, several years ago, I was on the Australian demo team instructors and we had a slope cordoned off so we could just do our training on it. Yep. And it, it stayed so good. You could still rip carving turns well into after lunchtime, yep. you know, because... That's- yeah, because of the way the skis were interacting with the snow, was not wasn't pushing all that snow down as fast. Or, or you're, as, you're talking as often. dreams here, brother, because it doesn't happen every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in those type of conditions, and yes, it, they just it just stays amazing. Like Aspen yeah. Convention conventions, I went to a couple of hard boot alpine events, and it's a, everyone's little slivers. The resorts just it didn't didn't get beat up. Yeah, yeah. Hey, onto onto boots because I'm a big like uh, I'm a feet person to be honest. I love, really enjoy understanding the mechanics of the feet and everything, and I think it's so important, especially both our sports. That's where everything comes through first. What have you done? Because we've talked about playing with board setup and stuff. What do you like to do with your boots and um, and that area of equipment? The interface is something I envision heavily, Tom. I'll literally sky's the limit with how we can think and meditate about skiing and snowboarding so i literally imagine if there's some alien let's not limit ourselves here brother i'm getting wild yeah yeah if there's an alien civilization out there that has been snowboarding for six hundred thousand years but they're in general humanoid form maybe they're more liquid maybe they're more skeletal i don't know how what if they've been skiing and snowboarding that long what have they developed for the interface between their bodies to the snow of these radiuses that we're gliding on? And for me, everything needs to just go higher. So, uh, and it needs to be more stiff. Um, these snowboard boots, I am on the ride in Sanos. It's got a hard plastic shell tongue. And that at least gives me leverage that I can use in my shins to drop, just drop those shins down and something's happening. Flexi boots. Oh, it's a, difficult task at that point liners is really what i want to dial in next um but the boots itself i do need to use soccer shin guards i had extra Ah. extra extra padding and i put i put that in between that i'm using an extra heel hold harness on these liners there's not it's not like zip fit stuff and you know i want to play with these liners so (laughs) I'm using an extra heel hold harness and that at least locks me in enough. I always need to flex. And here's a big problem for snowboarders. Like here's, here's me day one of ride in Sanos. They feel like a ski boot to me. They are just like so rigid that my work work around now is not even doing the top boa, just leaving it loose. But then now, you know, a hundred days in maybe on them. 60, I don't know, I broke a pair mid, mid seasons. So maybe it stays 60. Um, but later yeah. they just, they just crumbled where yeah. you, where you as skiers, I don't think you have to deal with these technical problems of total crap equipment <laughs> for an interface to the thing, at least Alpine snowboarders, they're in those hard shell skiish boots. 
and the consistency is pretty similar like whether it's day one to 100 like it's a gentler process of any break-in period these things day one to day five feels totally different five to 40 feels way different and then 40 to 60 in warm conditions when everything becomes more malleable it's just like the boots are folding everywhere so it's a so, that, that part's a technical hurdle and skiers are going to deal with that and that's why it, that's why your podcast is so valuable tom because i i'm thinking about these type of levels because i love your skiing podcast tom it's one of the two podcasts i listen to big picture skiing podcast and foosball radio and i love awesome. them love them equivalently and i keep on learning so much from them so props on Thank everything you. you're doing hey so here i thought it's worth mentioning because uh, um so where you're talking about the snowboard boot like it's great in the beginning that the forward flexion of the ankle yep. the equivalent in a ski boot the the problem you're dealing with so imagine skiers the sides of our boot that we tip laterally imagine after 30 days that started folding. So you go to roll okay. on edge and, and your knee is just driving you. You described that perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. Cause, cause I think there's a, there's an important point there because with ski boots, our fore and aft range is kind of our, our balance area. And we want to, yes, manipulate pressure front and back on the ski, but the real jam some, is out there. Yeah. Yep. And I think some people overthink that it's all like, cause they hear people talk about, Oh, you got to get so far forward and bend the tip of the ski. But, I, I would, I would, I'm going to ask you on this. I would say it's pretty sensitive. You're fore and aft. A lot of the time you're trying to stay feeling the tip and the tail and the center, right? Cent like, okay. Okay. Right Here's in the center. I got to go back to this diagram then. Okay. Got to. It's so important that I have a very singular focused thought. Todd Lafredo, if you ever, I'm a professional foosball player. I have learned a lot. Todd Lafredo taught me or showed me. I asked him to review my pull shot. He said it was two stroke. He has the one stroke. He's been the top player, one of the top players since the late seventies. And he's still at it. This is a guy with 100,000 hours of experience in professional foosball. He, so he saw it and told me, it didn't make sense to me for a long time, Tom, but there's cleaner lines of energy and it's with the ball positioning and as you're going across the ball going forward and you can snap in one, one stroke rather than back forward. Back. Got it. Just go forward. So like, this is, is, this is why like extracurricular activities I've been involved with helped my snowboarding. Cause I get to think about like, wow, absolutely one motion. Cause I have 10,000 hours in Tom. I even got second place at the pro doubles at world champ at the world championships once, but these top masters that if, if anyone wants to take a deep dive into how obsessive and how amazing this sport is that I've dedicated that this much time into foosballers just google it foosballers okay it's, it's a movie it's a documentary featuring one of the world championships re somewhat recently and it, these i've gone camping with some of these people i know these people like on a really high level where we just chat and stuff garrett schirkenbach he's in there we play foosball i got my table right there he comes over and we just jam and he's just got a little tiny segment in it but uh like I like the sport is crazy and you have to dial in the thoughts of how you can execute instantly without like giving away your body mechanics. So, it so has now to be, tell me, how does that relate back to the, yes, to my the front thought, back and yeah. So the dead middle molecule of my board, I'm on a, mm -hmm. I'm centered on a twin. Mm-hmm. My stance angles are equivalent, 15, negative 15. Yep. So the singular thought is bend the dead middle molecule of one edge towards where the other edge is. Bend it uh, away from me. That's the simplest thought I have. And as soon yeah. as I, when I'm gliding down a mountain all by myself, I can find it repeatedly. It's a struggle to find those thoughts when it's chaotic traffic and crap train and stuff but when it's yes. beautiful that's the most singular thought i have Bend that middle of the board away from me as soon as i transition so my overlap of transitions time sometimes when i'm not going fast 
it's like three quarters of my board length overlapping where you can see my toe side and my heel side edge overlapping where if I'm in a race, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Now tell me what happens you see with people who are not as they're dirty with their tracks, you know, their pure carving. Cause this is, this is related to linking a pure carved arc from the heel onto the toe or left to a right carve in, in a ski turn. Do you find, would you say that the people that often dirty the top of the turn, they're, they're not bending that single middle center molecule. They're bending some, somewhere else, like either towards the tail of the tip, correct? I, I just describe it as for whatever reason, they're smearing the turn. And I, don't, I can't get into each and every person's minds. And of yeah. course, skiers or racing aspects are different. But well, why smear the turn? There's friction. Everyone puts friction down the mountain. I don't want friction. I just want pure glide. So it, it's, uh, yeah, just they're, they're not willing to trust their equipment in certain, yep. in, in certain aspects for some people, some people just so want to get, it. some people want to get down to the base of the resort. I don't know why you want to do that. Then you have to wait in a chairlift line. That part sucks. That's the worst part of the day. It was just standing around in a big old herd of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to be there. I just want to enjoy all that glide. So to hit yeah. that glide, you know, hang on to the previous turn. Maybe it's one, 1,000. Maybe it's one, 1,000 to 1,000. If the snow is real fast and, and uh, not too steep, Maybe it's one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. Yeah. Like those <clears throat> red lines. Today, I was you, emptiest runs I've had all year. And the conditions were great. Feedback snow, Tom, with just a squishy level of wet snow. It started uh, misting this morning on the bottom and snowing on top. But those red and you know, look, maybe orange and yellow ones, those lines that would normally seem boring to me. I was just using the whole width of the run and trust falling my center of mass into those turns. Yeah. Enjoying it. Not yeah. knowing that no one else is out there and each and every run then say, say eight runs later, I'm trying to achieve something similar. And I spot one of my own little arced slivers in the run. I just try to connect with it and make it look like a skier's tracks two tracks so i'll pick the left side of it and usually it, yeah. it ends up and i'll just like okay what was my decision making there okay try, see it transition there and i just try to match it up to where if you're on a chairlift it's a confusing line tom because yeah, it's yeah, like it's... you're someone's watching a knowledgeable skier which there ain't too many out there <laughs> yeah breckenridge like it's a clown show now they're used yep. to, but uh <clears throat> if someone's who, who, a trained eye looking at the skiers lines like that all of a sudden they'll get confused because i might cross my own path so yeah it's, it's yeah. an interesting thought experiment that's cool that's very cool that's very cool hey i just uh i'm thinking i want to keep talking like basically all day but i have to go visit my uh my mom and she's four hour drive away and, Understood, and pick up my son Understood. But i'm it's trying to think pleasure would, yeah but i'm trying pleasure. to think what would i want to ask like right now finishing up and um so the thought that the, the thought i had is okay what do you think if you watch skiers in general and maybe let's not say beginners but people who are like trying to have a go yep. from your outside eye watching them and knowing the kind of turns we're trying to make here so we're not talking yep. about big mountain turns where carb turns Got it. do you have one piece of advice that you would say would you know, you would say to those people, hundred percent, go to some mellower train that is wide. That's a groomed consistent surface and just hang on to your turns for a little longer than you expect. There's no, there's no ceremony at the bottom for getting there fast. I love it. So true. And you know what I would add on to that. You're going to find that's far easier and more enjoyable. If you get off those fat, skis the design oh, for... oh the fat skis They're, they they just jiggle yeah, just around they yeah, just yeah, jiggle yeah. oh yeah i never you see know. anyone doing it right with those 
you know, yeah. in, so in on get the, runs for carving. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, if you really want to maximize your time, like you maximize your season, early season, when it's just snow making snow and all the rocks are still exposed and everything, you can have possibly the best day of your life riding arcs. Right. So if you get equipment that is not just your 99, 108 underfoot floppy thing that's meant for those rare days where it does snow a bunch get something else in your quiver that that can do what you're talking about and i think people will find like magic and joy yeah yeah and, and like and, and as you said like i think we both love we're, it. to the it, point it, where you can't even you can't wait to wake up and go play again yeah just and it's go just, play it's, on a mountain play with some physics yeah. Yep, it's my it's definitely my form of 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 meditation, of yoga, whatever you want to say. It's my way of getting into feeling every part of my body, feeling you know, interactions with the snow. And it, it is just absolutely so much joy. Um, so that would be my advice on top of yours, which I think together is yeah, is, and that's is the very best cool. Part. And that's the best part, the sensations, the yeah. sensations. And when you can have a high level of expectations of what sensations will occur, whoo, that's the magic. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? There's a, it, it's not that consequential it's not or dangerous. Hard. It's no. not physically hard. Tom, today w- the gondola shut down a couple of days ago. I now have to get off of bus and walk up 59 steps. Oh my God. But those 59 <laughs> steps walking up, I do it slow and rhythmically, and but it's the hardest part of my whole day physically. Just walking <laughs> yeah. up the steps to the where the snow is. <laughs> yeah. The rest yeah. is just pure glide and effortless on the body, and it feels so good. How can it yeah. not be addicting to where you just want to go hit the re- replay button? Uh, totally, totally. All right, we need to do round two. I'd love so, it. Tom. Uh, yeah, and I've got some things that uh, I want to share with you. I think equipment-wise, with the boots especially, I reckon would be some cool areas to to delve into to get what there you want. Go. So yeah, I'd love to share that with you. But Ryan, thank you for your time. And uh, like, yeah, as I said, I want to keep chatting. I'm sure people, I hope that people have really enjoyed this. Keep ripping it up. I don't know when you're going to, you're probably going to keep snowboarding until the season in Australia here starts. So you lucky bastard. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm literally testing out product stuff. So I just can't wait. And I hope the snow conditions stay as well as they are. So, cause I, awesome. you know, I only feel this amazing on the snow at the, towards the end of the later parts of the season with the, you know, the sports specific muscles, just firing where at the beginning of the season, it's really hard to find that. So any first day people like the first days of the year, hold back just find out the mellow sensations you want and maybe a couple things here and there but yep yep if you if you try to rip too hard all the time that fails real quick i'm sure you had friends this season got super keen on the big powder days and then they acl or something and then their season's done in in the past always happens in the past it's been crazy time yeah yeah just exactly take it easy red lines work up the spectrum I love that. That's my that's that's my next visual out there. Thanks. It Ryan. just feels so good on days like that. You make the smart decisions for what you got, what's being offered. Yeah. Thank, Cheers, thank you, my Tom. Friend. <laughs>